Hey, greetings YouTube. Performance reviews where I give you the review from the technician's point of view. And today, we're going to talk about the Dyson DC-14. Now, this is not the original Dyson we got in this country, but this was maybe one of the more common variants, and this was a fix to a lot of the problems that the DC-07 has. Because, you know, Mr. I, I, I spend my life inventing prototypes. I thought that was a good idea. Yes, man of 500 prototypes. Well, this is like 502. Uh, but the DC-14 solves the cyclone issue that plagued the 07s. Now, if you've never seen an 07, what happened with the 07 was that the cyclone basically had to fight gravity and the holes were too small. And originally also the cyclone didn't have a lock on it. So customers were picking it up and dropping the vacuum down the stairs. Uh, so there were actually like three different revisions of the DC-07. It was clear that the cyclones needed improvement and they came to the DC-14, which shares most of its parts with the 07, but not all of the parts. So it's like an improved 07. And then this product would then be improved on later as the DC-33, where they took this and they made it as cost-effective to manufacture as possible. It was already very cost-effective. This cost, at the time, way under $100 to produce, and these were made in Malaysia. When I think of Dyson, this is kind of one of the first machines besides an 07. This comes to mind, and like a DC-41 comes to mind when you see the word Dyson. So, to me, this is a very iconic design. It's got its flaws, don't get me wrong, but it, it is an iconic design, and it probably will be nostalgic to a lot of you because this machine's been around so long. This was probably the first Dyson I worked on uh, back when they first launched. We had 07s in the store and then we had 14s for sale and we didn't have any uh, 07s that were in for warranty at the time. We had just become a Dyson dealer. We were like two weeks into it. Uh, and they sent this little blonde girl out a uh, little valley girl from California out to show us how to do a clutch and repair it, but she didn't actually have the strength to put the clutch in the Dyson, which was kind of hysterical. So she was showing me and another gentleman who was in his 70s uh, how to do this, and we were like, uh, no. So we ended up kind of, she, she explained to us how to do it, and she wanted us to do it laying flat on the bench, and later we would turn the machine upside down like you'd work on a sanitaire or really any other vacuum cleaner. Uh, and do it much easier. So this is a 14 and this is like how I got introduced to the 14. Now the other thing about this 14 is I have wanted one of these for a very long time and it took me probably about two years of just looking at thrift stores and kind of glancing over Craigslist occasionally to find one. Most of these are gone even though they made millions of these most of these are gone in the trash. The plastics have gotten brittle on most of these uh, you can see on this one, the decolorization of the cyclone. Those are actually two different types of plastics. And Dyson had a lot of problems, particularly in the early years, with plastic injection molding and getting the mixture right with the pellets. So there was a lot of problem with that. And we saw 07s and 14s and 18s and all, all, all sorts of other models in the early years of Dyson literally like chipping away and breaking. So that was a huge issue with Tyson at the time, despite all the other problems with this. So I'm just gonna show you my 14. We're gonna do like a little tour of the machine. I'm gonna do a pickup test on my, uh, on my carpet. I'll show you how that works. We'll also do one on hard floor because it does do hard floor. We're not gonna do an in the shop section, but I'll, I'll explain to you the clutch. Okay, let's start with the clutch. That's a good story. So the clutch on a Dyson is this part right here, and this is what turns the brush roller on and off. That's a secondary function of the clutch. The other thing the clutch is doing is it's reducing gearing from the motor. The motor spins really, really fast uh, in these early machines, and rather than putting a second motor for the brush, what they did was they took a rubber belt, put it inside a clutch, and a second rubber belt going uh, to the brush. And the real purpose of that was to slow the belt drive down on the brush so that you had the torque and you weren't burning belts so fast. So what's kind of cool about this is, even though this is a rubber belt design, it's sealed up fairly well. So you can get about a year and a half, two years out of this clutch before it needs to be replaced. Now, 
These had five-year warranties, which meant most of them would have the clutch changed under warranty if somebody thought to uh, do so. If it has been over two years since the clutch was changed, it's time to change the clutch. And that was kind of ingenious in itself. There were a lot of vacuum shops at the time kind of saying, oh, Dyson will is a phase, they're going to pass, whatever. But I, I saw this a different way at the time, and I think a lot of uh, vacuum shops later caught on. This is a $100 belt change. You have this clutch mechanism that you're going to sell for like 60 70 bucks, and then you have to charge labor to put the damn thing in. So it's at least a $100 belt change. Well, shit. You know, where other companies had gone to geared belts and away from this sort of thing, Dyson was adding a maintenance to a machine that was sold as no maintenance. So it really kind of put a lot of customers in between a rock and a hard place and having to invest a lot of money to keep their brush rollers spinning. So that's one of those things. It's very much a Dyson thing, but this isn't what a lot of people think of Dyson. But if you've been in the vacuum industry, this is what you think of Dyson. You think of the, oh God, this is the guy who can't who can't stop making prototypes and none of them won't quite work right. Um, and this one's no different. Headphone warning. That sound you just heard is what happens when you stall the brush roller either on too high of carpet, accidentally bump the head, or when the clutch starts going out. Now, when the clutch goes out, it doesn't always make that sound, but a lot of times it does, and that really uh, scared a lot of customers. And I think a lot of these lasted a lot longer because it made that horrible sound and customers did bring them in. The other thing about the 14, it has a lot of carryovers from the 07. That's both good and bad, and we're, let me explain some of them. One of my favorite carryovers uh, is this guy right here. If you look right here, uh, there's a space where the filter would have been on the 07. Now, some of these would later not have this quick release. They would get rid of that and it would just be straight up. And that's how the majority of them were. Some of them would have this quick release piece. Um, some people would later also add them and people would get very confused. People would often confuse them for 07s and they would try to put the filter in here. And there's a, even a, a nice little reminder in there that shows hey, the, the filter's not in this compartment. Instead of the filter being up here on the 14, the filter would of course be in this compartment here. Now during the development of the 14, they were co-developing the 15 and they would use the same cyclone assembly. And the idea is that the 14 would be like their mid to entry level model and they would discontinue the 07. Really, the 07 and the 14 were sold side by side and the 07 was like the lower version of the 14 and the difference was like $50. So a lot of people went for the 07. But something that's interesting that we see inside here is that there's this space for blank hardware here. And if you see this screw, not only is that holding this on, but all this other hardware on 15, there was a little gizmo thing. And what that kept, kept you from doing was running it without the filter. Something they pulled out of the 07 as a cost-cutting measure and something they would get rid of as an idea after the 15 altogether. It turns out it's far more profitable for the customer to ruin the vacuum than to prevent them to use it without the filters. The 14 would have a slightly larger filter than the 07 and the 15 would have a slightly different shape of this, but they're interchangeable. Again, not a big deal. This one is a generic. The one this one came with was just completely shot. Also in here is a suction relief valve so that if you get something clogged in the machine, it opens up and allows the motor to breathe. This was quite common to have turn on. I would also see some vacuum shops uh, snip these. <laughs> there were some dirty vacuum shops that would snip these so that these things would open up under normal use and the machine would have less power Again, trying to get the customer to buy a machine. And in here, you can see the Cyclones. And I like this Cyclone design. Not only is it fairly effective for what it is, but it's fairly usable, user serviceable. So on the back, and this is just more Dyson weirdness. Everything is always a weird shape with Dyson, but there's this clear purple part. And 
If we pull this out, if a customer were to rinse this cyclone out, it would only take a day or two to dry and it would get completely dry. Unlike newer models that have to be fully disassembled for them to dry, this actually would air out and you could use it. So it allows the user to clean out the cyclone, which really needs to be done about once a year. These things get incredibly funky. And this clear bin right here is probably one of the clearest ones you're gonna see. You can buff these out, but why bother? Now, something I thought was cool is I have the stickers still on mine intact, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, and you can see on the sticker, they have an illustration of the 07 Cyclone, not the 14 Cyclone, because they carried over the sticker. Again, these were really, the 07, the 15, and the 14 were really all sold at the same time for the most part. The 15 was probably the first of the three to really be discontinued even though technically the 07 should have been discontinued. Now on top of here, we have tool storage. They moved the tool storage from on the main body to the Cyclone. Nothing wrong with that. Again, I have uh, pattern tools on here. You'll have to excuse that. You know, I'm a man with over a hundred vacuums. I'm not, everything is gonna be completely perfect all the time. I don't, don't have the funds for that. Uh, speaking of funds, Big thank you to our Patreon supporters that donated the money to help fix this machine up to make this video. And there's a Patreon exclusive of me fixing this machine up if you wanna see that over on Patreon. Now, on the subject of filters, let's go to where the HEPA filter is. Cause it says lifetime HEPA on here. That was something that they advertised and Dyson was super big into. Let's talk about the lifetime filter. Let's get to it first. And you need a screwdriver. <laughs> Do it. Uh, so first you want to pop this. Oh, this one popped right up. Uh, but usually you would pop on the sides. I filmed another video with this. And I think it was just loose from that. So I have a genuine filter in here and you have to order a genuine one. And then separately, you have to order the gasket. Really stupid, don't know why they did that, but you have to get a different gasket assembly plus the filter. Now you can see there's some dust in here and we can see right away there's sand on top of mine. And mine has been cleaned out and refurbished. And I've run this uh, once since I refurbished it, to give you an idea. The, these tend to accumulate dust and debris in here on top of the motor. Now the motor is actually sitting on its side. Um, even though this is circular, it's actually sitting on its side like that uh, with the motor shaft spindling around there. There, uh, is a big problem with this is once these fill up, which takes about a year, maybe two years, uh, depending on usage, what happens is the gasket gets blown out and dust just starts leaking out the back. So you'll see these where they'll just be covered with dust because they're spewing dust out that way. And that's very common for any bagless vacuum really, is that once the HEPA filter gets full, then the gasket goes and just starts going around the filter. So you do need to keep an eye on this lifetime filter and it's uh, not the lifetime of the machine as intended. And Dyson used to argue that the carbons from the motor would never fill up this filter. Well, the whole problem with that is it isn't the motor carbons that are blocking this filter. It's the stuff that goes through the pre-motor filter and the cyclones because cyclones don't filter down fine enough. The cyclones are good for maybe one micron, maybe five microns worth of filtration depending on the item, really depending on the item. Uh, there's some real fine stuff that can move right through cyclones. There's some real fine stuff that gets stuck in cyclones, so it really depends on what it is. And again, this is the only thing before the motor. This is post-motor. So that extra debris in the motor means that the fan and stuff can get all the usual gunk in it, just like when we see a bag vacuum run without a bag. Well, this essentially gets run without a bag and as soon as the pre-motor filter gets compromised that will be the end of the motor. Let's see how much working vacuum this thing has. So it actually has about a hundred inches sealed but only eight, about 75 inches of that's available before the blow-off valve kicks in and we have about 40 inches of working vacuum. Maybe 41. It's a pretty healthy number. I want to show you how much suction power this machine gets without the cyclone attached.
We get over 60 inches of working vacuum without the cyclone attached. It does have a pretty powerful motor, but so much of that efficiency is lost through the cyclone. And that's kind of the sad truth of basically every bagless machine, is you can throw a powerful motor in it. As you can see, this motor rivals something like a Henry or a small central vacuum system in terms of how much uh, sealed suction it has, and even working vacuum. But you can see not a lot of that translates into the unit. Man, this is a quirky machine, as Doug DeMera would say. I forgot how many quirks there were on this until we started filming. So the way this switches from the floor nozzle to the tools is this guy right here switches back and forth, like so. And something could happen is a customer could bump and it could get out of place. Now, what's cool about this is, this is like the first right angle bend. You can pull this out and look for a blockage. So forward thinking on their part for the customer to be able to get to that. Um, unfortunately, this stuff gets brittle and would break and you'd have to replace the whole housing. The other part, why we're on talking about blockages, is on the bottom side. Now this would carry over, man, um, somebody might have to comment in below all the models that had this. This is the YouTube. Later, they would make this clear which was a really smart decision, even though the clear wasn't as strong. Uh, people suck up pens and pencils, and that is primarily what gets stuck in here. And this is, again, one of the places where there was almost always a blockage when I would see these in for service. Uh, so, yeah. And this is, again, this is supposed to be ABS plastic, this. Again, they had trouble with their plastic molding, so it's not exactly normal ABS. Uh, and that just goes and clips in right here. And again, some of the stuff is tool of service. It's a good idea. There is a metal axle also going around to the wheels. I think that's smart. Now let's get to the cleaner head because that's kind of the interesting part of this. So the cleaner head is different and the same as the 07. The brush roller is the same, the clutch is the same, but the purple part and the sole plate are different. Now you'll notice that there is a hole in the front of the sole plate. And Dyson tried to describe this through marketing as a large item pickup hole. That is not the purpose of this hole. The purpose of this hole is the machine had no height adjustment. And to compensate for that on deeper pile carpet, that is a suction relief so that they didn't have to make a height adjustment for this machine. Even though it's a free floating head, it still had no height adjustment and it would be hard to push on certain surfaces. That was their solution. Let's just put a hole in the head. So that's an improvement over the 07. And later in Dyson's development, we would see uh, the Dyson Air Muscle, the DC-28, where they would try to make a height adjustment. They tried to adjust uh, address this issue and they royally fucked that up. That's a subject for its own video. Um, so let's get to the brush roller, which was supposed to be user serviceable, kinda sorta. So you can take a coin and do not use a damn screwdriver. Always use a coin or you need like a number six or larger screwdriver. And unless you have a set of like PB tools or a real high end screwdriver set, you're not going to have that. So use a coin if you can. And this pops up out like that. And you'll see there's a seal there. And these little wheels, these would get ground off and lost. They were actually replaceable by themselves for a while. You can see how scratched up this base plate is. Again, I ran this through my house just, just for fun once when a friend was in town. Now the brush roller, it's kind of strange. Um, there's not very many bristles on this and the replacement brush rollers, the aftermarket ones were really bad. They were known for cracking and then they also didn't have as many bristles on them. So they would worsen performance. Again, all this was okay by dealers who didn't know how to properly make a good argument of why a customer shouldn't buy a Dyson at the time. And you know, now, now that they've been on the market, we know the quality is pretty bad and we know that they're extremely high maintenance. And I think that's, that's the argument to be made, uh, not neuter the machine uh, without the customer's permission. Now, something that's interesting is at the time they had side feed suction. It wasn't exactly all the way off the side, but it is side feed suction, which was common for the time but it's not relatively a great idea because on this side, it's not gonna clean the same as this side. And that really 
when you get to a hard floor or deeper pile carpet, really any surface, that's, that's quite bad. Uh, so uneven cleaning paths. And this machine is right around the time that the Carpet and Rug Institute and all the rug carpet manufacturers realized people were buying Dysons, and these are not deep cleaners. The big problem with that is they were ruining carpets by leaving embedded dirt in. So they said, oh, nope, if you, use, if you have a Dyson home, we are not going to honor our carpet warranty because you have not cleaned it properly. So that was something, this was kind of the machine that started that. And Dyson throughout time has kind of gone up and down like the stock market and whether they have a machine that deep cleans or cleans well. Um, the DC-17 that came after this was a very good cleaner, but had particularly sharp bristles, which could rip, rip into the carpet and cut the carpet, but it was a good cleaner. Uh, the 27 was an excellent cleaner. The Air Muscle was an excellent cleaner when it worked. And the DC-50 was a decent cleaner. But then when they started going to like the DC-40, DC-41, they started going down and they didn't clean as well. And the reason I'm mentioning that is people would upgrade these Dysons to a 41 or whatever. And then what would happen was if they had one of these, it would come in the shop and they would want to spend hundreds of dollars fixing these Dysons because they didn't like how the 41 or the 40 performed at the time. So people really held on to these and really used these uh, past their life expectancy. And this is where Dyson came up with that five year life expectancy. This is the machine they came up with it on as well when they started publishing that. Um, they used to also have a recycling program that said that on their website, but that's long gone. Uh, maybe somebody with the internet time machine can go find that. So back to the head, there's a rope gasket around here, this rope gasket. Uh, you have to be very careful when you open and close this. You can disturb that, and it never goes back right. Uh, it's really hard to put back. So this just kind of rocks in to there like that. Another thing why we're down here is that these tabs that hold this on are really thin, and they tend to break when you're changing the brush roller if you're not careful. And you can pull this brush roller out without a clutch tool, but you cannot put this brush roller back without a clutch tool without damaging something. And if you have one of these... Unless you have that clutch tool and you're really familiar with doing that, or you know somebody who's a technician who's really familiar with doing that, I highly recommend just bring it to your local vacuum shop who's done thousands of these and just have them do it for you. It's, it's worth whatever they're charging in labor. So let's rock this thing back on, put this cover back on. No, it doesn't exact, not great how it goes back together. We'll use this coin. Now these side bristles on here did absolutely nothing, nor did its edge cleaning. The edge cleaning was pretty bad on this machine as well. Uh, there's one other fatal flaw on this design that again, with the 17, they would fix. You know, the 17, they would put springs on this, but it uses the internal hose to make contact with the floor. So this hose is what pushes this up against the floor. And when the spring tension of the hose goes, then the machine stops making contact with the floor. Um, again, that's a problem with the, the 07, the 14, and the 33, um, and I believe it's a problem with the 04 as well, though we never really got those in this country. I said it took me a long time to find one of these. One thing I have not replaced because, I, again, I've got a collection of vacuums, but it, I'll eventually replace it, is this guy. This should have some holes in it and be a matching color. Somebody put the wrong one on this, and I haven't bothered to change it. Cord release here. Release is very easy and puts it in your hand, so that's a good thing. The uh, cord release is part of the wand assembly, so if you break the cord hook, you have to replace the whole wand assembly, and it's like 80 bucks, so that was kind of... Again, customers really got stooped in terms of parts with this. The cord was of excellent quality. I've never had any problems with the Dyson cords. Um, they wire in fairly easy. The switch is also... Fairly high quality, they went with a third party manufacturer with the switch. Now one of the biggest improvements from a user's point of view between the 07 and the 14 was how the tools worked. So you pull the wand up, you press this, and the hose is actually attached to the wand. With previous models you used to had, have to like assemble it weird and it's kind of hard to use. Now one thing I don't like about this is storing the wand on here kind of awkward. It will only store in the locked upright position, causing the machine to tilt. So if you want to use, say, the hand tools, like so, well, <laughs> what do you do with the wand? And that's, that's kind of a problem with 
any machine where the handle and the wand are the same piece. And it's one of the reasons I hate that design at, from a user's point of view. Um, from a manufacturing point of view, I cannot imagine the billions of dollars they've saved by doing that. So yeah, all this just kind of clips on. And there's some gizmos in here. There's some springs and some locks in here that can fail and get dirty. And at this time, they were still using the aluminum wand. This is before they would go to the polymer wand like we'd see in the 33s. So that's kind of cool as well. And then to put it back in, you just hit the button again and it slides in there. Now, if this is hard to, to go in there, basically your hose has gotten too dirty or somebody's put the wrong aftermarket hose on here. You can fit a DC-07 hose on the bottom, but the DC-07 has a different locking point on here on the top. Uh, so that's, again, a common thing to look for if you're wanting to collect one of these. Lastly, there's a decent strain relief on the cord. Now, this had a abnormally long hose for the time, and it still has a really long stretch hose, even by today's standards. Dyson doesn't include as long of a stretch hose. It was something like 17 feet all the way stretched out. Just absolutely ridiculous. But you could pull it around like a canister. So the low-mounted hose was again good it was innovative for the time there are other companies that would do this about the same time but it's just something that makes it nice to use when you need to use the accessories i need to talk about this tool and why it exists so because the dyson whoops because the dyson is so bulky and doesn't actually lie flat dyson used to include on any machine that was a full kit or an animal or any of the above, they used to always include a separate tool. And this was to get under areas. This gets really flat, and basically it's a copy of a Vissel Work design. By this time, Dyson was no longer supplying Vissel Work turbos. But this floor tool, it works fairly well. Um, and these floor tools, you can still find them like brand new today. Nobody ever used them. So most of them are unused. And they have a really nice swivel neck on them. This is one of those things where Dyson did something that was better than what came later. So it's really frustrating to see where Dyson is now because the swivel neck is perfect and <laughs> they have a lot of bad swivel necks now because they have to put a ball in it somehow and swivel necks don't need a ball. But using this is fairly good if you are, you know, like below five foot 10, this is probably the right height for you. I am six foot three and I'll tell you what, this wand, in this configuration like this is way too short for me. Now, at the time, Dyson was using an inch and a quarter fitting and their upholstery tool did rotate and had the limb pickers. Again, this is a pattern tool, but other than the plastic being slightly higher quality than the original Dyson's, there's not much of a difference. And the dusting brush, it's the same way that it rotated and locked. The bristles were kind of stiff, but overall, the standard tools were fairly high quality. They would use numerous different turbo tools with this. There was a really bulky turbo tool that I don't have. Most of them were thrown away. They rarely worked right. Uh, I'll put a picture right here for you. All right, you're gonna have to excuse the background noise. We have the furnace going, there's a snowstorm outside. So our noise floor is much higher than it usually is. Our studio mic is connected. You'll get to hear the real sound of this Dyson on hard floor. Let's give it a go. So if you're paying attention, you notice the dog hair got blown away a little bit. And the reason for that is the exhaust goes straight out in all directions on the Dyson. And as you can see, that kind of creates problems. So let's see what it did. So we left a little bit of flour behind, real fine dust. And again, there's no squeegee or anything on here, so uh, it doesn't really surprise me. What did surprise me is that it did pick up the cat litter in the grout, didn't move anything around. So it does mostly as advertised on hard floor. I want to show the, uh, exhaust coming out so you get an idea here. I'm going to switch this over to carpet mode. 
impossible to get socks on. You actually have to bend over to do it. And then let's hit the on button and see how it does on my soft carpet. First thing I notice is it just like snow plowed a bunch of the cat litter and the breakfast cereal in front of it. So as I said, that hole is not really to pick up big objects, it's a suction relief hole. So let's see, there's a ton of flour in the carpet still, it rubbed it in. I don't know how much it's going to show on camera. We're filming at night so I'm using studio lights and they're the contrast might not be the best. We'll see. Uh, but, but um, that, oh my goodness, cat, there's a bunch of cat litter here. Uh, let me see if I can grab a piece. It like, it like pushed the stuff into the carpet and sucked stuff out at the same time. Um, oh my gosh. There's a bunch of animal hair too. I mean, that is, it's not the worst carpet pickup test I've done, but it's pretty bad. And you guys have gotten used to me demonstrating some pretty powerful machines over the years. And this machine has a decent amount of power, but the agitation and the nozzle design really hinders that power. Also, cyclones cut off a lot of airflow. And you don't hear me talk about this a lot on the channel, but this machine does not have a tremendous amount of airflow. It has a tremendous amount of suction and you need both to clean carpet well. I wanna thank you for watching our little retrospective review on the Dyson DC-14. And I probably said DC-07 a whole bunch of times when I shouldn't have, so thank you for hanging in there. If you like this sort of content, give it a thumbs up. That helps us out a whole lot. If you have a 14, comment below. I wanna hear about your Dyson 14 experience. Heck, if you have an 07, I wanna hear from you. So hit that comment section up. Now, if you want to talk about other vacuum cleaners, go check out the link to our Discord server where we talk vacuum cleaners all day long. There are links in the description box to some common items available for this on Amazon. Hopefully that helps somebody as well. Thanks for watching. Have yourself a great day.